Hey, I'm Damon Garcia, and I am a passionate, I might even say hardcore Christian, but I'm definitely not an evangelical. And in this video, I'm going to talk about why I can't be an evangelical and how my beliefs have changed over the years. So in my last video, I talked about five things I'd tell my teenage evangelical self now, and the link is in the description for that, so check that out. But in there, I also talked about how I grew up evangelical, and then by taking this stuff seriously, absolutely seriously, I studied way more and studied historic Christianity and also modern scholarship so I could be responsible with the way I study historic Christianity, and through that, I ended up having so many shifts and differences when it came to looking at the evangelical faith I grew up with, and I no longer fit within it. I outgrew it. I know plenty of people who feel the same way, who are Christian, and then they end up leaving Christian communities for Christian reasons. And this is a group of people that I'm very passionate about interacting with. And so I'm going to talk about the ways that I ended up shifting and I just couldn't be an evangelical anymore. But let's first talk about what is an evangelical for those who have no idea or have just heard it and not sure what it means. Unfortunately, plenty of people just associate the word evangelical with just all Christians. But no, evangelical is sort of a type of Christian. Evangelical is not a specific church or a specific organization or a specific denomination. It is an umbrella term for several denominations that all have pretty much the same core beliefs. Reading from their Wikipedia page here, it says in 2016, there was an estimated 619 million evangelicals in the world, meaning that one in four Christians would be classified as evangelical. And yes, that's a lot, but it's not all. <laughs> And then it says American evangelicals are a quarter of the nation's population and its single largest religious group. The main movements are Baptist churches, evangelical Anglicanism, Wesleyanism, confessional reformed churches, including the Presbyterian Church in America, Pentecostalism, which is what I grew up in charismatic evangelicalism, neo-charismatic evangelicalism, and non-denominational Christianity, which is something really important here because several people feel so cool and self-congratulatory when they tell you, oh, yeah, I go to a non-denominational church as if, like, I don't deal with all that drama that all you, den all you denominations deal with. I go to a non-denominational church. But so often these non-denominational church have churches that are over them or that sent them and therefore like require them to still believe things that the sending church believes. Also, they usually subscribe to a particular version of evangelicalism. I saw this meme the other day, the Scooby-Doo meme where Fred takes off the mask and says, let's see who's really behind the mask. And so it showed the person in the mask and over them it was written non-denominational churches. Takes it off and it just says, Baptists. <laughs> which is actually really, really common. Plenty of non-denominational churches are just Baptist or Pentecostal. Now, big Christian groups besides evangelicals are, of course, Catholicism, which aren't evangelical, Orthodox Christian, which really stems from Eastern Orthodoxy. It's not really as popular in the United States, more in the East part of the world. And I said all evangelicals are Protestants, which basically just means not Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. And there are other kinds of Protestants, though, and I'm talking about the mainline churches. And mainline Protestants made up the majority of the Protestants in the United States until the mid-20th century when evangelicalism boomed. And mainline churches include the United Methodist Church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the Presbyterian Church, the Episcopal Church, the American Baptist Church, the United Church of Christ and the Disciples of Christ, as well as the Quakers, Reformed Church in America, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and other churches. Anyway, I just wanted to start off saying all that, getting all that out there, because I am absolutely annoyed when people talk about I left Christianity and then when they say all the reasons they left it and they hate it they list things that are only unique to evangelical Christianity and it's like 
ugh, it just makes me annoyed and really sad because it's like there's so much more room in the Christian tradition than just evangelicalism. So let's get into why I can't be an evangelical Christian. In order to determine evangelical statistics, the National Association of Evangelicals and Lifeway Research put together four distinguishing statements. And people must strongly agree with these four statements in order to be classified as an evangelical when taking these statistics. So let's go through them. The first one is, the Bible is the highest authority for what I believe. Now I think about this, this is kind of tricky because this is kind of a bait and switch because I would answer that by saying, yeah, sure, probably, but I know that there are some other beliefs tied to that, that I'd be required to believe. For example, believing that the entire Bible is inerrant, infallible, and directly, absolutely inspired through the lips of God and the entire thing must be read as literal, historical, factual events. Now, all of these are very modern ways of talking about the Bible, rooted in a very severe misunderstanding of how people told stories in the ancient Near East. And yes, they are modern. I'm talking post-enlightenment, when the scientific method became the standard for what we determined as factual and truthful. And the Christians responded by saying, um, well, we know this is true, so therefore we're gonna say that the whole thing is true in the same way that you're saying science is true. But it wasn't written that way at all. And several Christians before that didn't definitely not think about the Bible about that way. Origen, for example, one of the first Christian theologians in the third century said, all these biblical heresies are actually rooted in them reading it literally. And he even talked about the story of Adam and Eve and said, who could be so foolish to read this literally? This is clearly symbolic. And he actually even believed that the Bible came straight from God, which is now considered a very, very conservative belief. But he believed it came straight from God. But what he did with that belief is say, so of course the whole thing is to be read spiritually or allegorically, symbolically, not literally. Humans tell literal stories. Why would God give us literal historical stories? No, he's going to give us spiritual stories with all kinds of meaning that we get out of it. And this was very much the standard of approaching the Bible all the way up until the Enlightenment. And of course, it's filled with errors and contradictions because they weren't trying to create a history book. The original curators knew that the contradictions were there. Of course they did, but they knew that wasn't the point. So yes, the Bible probably is the highest authority for what I believe, but I take the Bible so seriously that I can't read it literally. Okay, next one. It is very important for me personally to encourage non-Christians to trust Jesus Christ as their savior. Now, yet again, this is another answer of, yeah, sort of, but not really, but yeah because it's yet again a little bit of a bait and switch and i would actually word it by saying as a christian it is very important for me personally to encourage everyone christian or non-christian to follow the way of jesus which isn't really about beliefs it's about the way of jesus not to encourage them to follow the religion of christianity because the way of Jesus transcends the religion of Christianity. Because it is the way of sacrificial love and the forgiveness of enemies and serving the sick and poor. Things that all people, no matter what they believe about the universe and the meaning of it and how we got here and where we're going, can all participate in. And I very much believe Jesus was all for that as well. I think of when a Roman centurion came to Jesus, this story, and he says, can you heal my slave? Now this Roman centurion was definitely not Jewish, even though Jesus said, I'm only here for the Jews. And his movement led to a new religion, Christianity. 
this Roman centurion was a total pagan, believed in all these other gods, and yet he believed Jesus could perhaps heal my servant. And Jesus' response was, wow, I have seen more faith in this guy than in any of my followers. And then he heals his servant. So I think it's very important to look back at stories like that and look forward to what the spirit is doing in the world today and embrace other faiths. Affirm people of other faiths who are also doing similar work. That's what I'm about. Next, Jesus Christ's death on the cross is the only sacrifice that could remove the penalty of my sin. Ugh, I hate this because this is what we're getting into now, atonement theory. Atonement, at one minute. What happened on the cross? What happened? The answer to what happened is atonement theories. And one of them, one of many, is penal substitutionary theory, which didn't come about until the 11th century from Anselm, and then wasn't popularized until the reformers. The Protestant reformers, who were a bunch of lawyers, so it was very easy for them to take modern le legal theory and just place it onto the story of the cross. And they totally just butchered it. <laughs> they took their modern legal theory of a crime was done, someone must be punished, and you, the person who did the crime, must be punished. But what God does, who has to punish someone for all the sin, is place his own son in their place and kill him so that we are no longer guilty of our crimes. Like I said, that's modern legal theory and pretty awful and very much used as a way of, I th probably at the beginning, just an easy way to explain things because the cross is a mystery, which is a very, very, very important Christian doctrine throughout all of Christian history, but it eventually became just an easy way to control people. I see the death of Jesus on the cross and think about the context of him also saying, you take up your crosses too and follow me. And Jesus was yet another brown body executed by the state, put on a stake, killed in front of everyone as a way to deter other minorities from standing up to the powers that be, which at the time was Rome. And I see Jesus dying for our sins the same way that you could kind of say Martin Luther King Jr. died for our sins. He fought for equality and changes in the system and because of humanity's sins and we have a long track record of killing people who are trying to change things, he was killed. And through his death, we are inspired to follow a similar path. Remember, all the early Christians were also put on crosses. Okay, last one. Only those who trust in Jesus Christ alone as their savior receive God's free gift of eternal salvation. And the subtext of that, of course, is, and the rest go to eternal damnation. Now, I think that doctrine is a gross misinterpretation of the scriptures and doesn't get us anywhere. I very much see the first Christians in the book of Acts going around telling people not you don't want to go to hell, do you? If you don't follow us, then you might end up being tortured forever after you die. But instead it was, hey, Jesus did this for all of us. We all are in. We are all saved. Don't you want to have a relationship with the God who did this for us? That's really what the first Christians were doing when they were going around spreading this thing. And when it comes to the views throughout Christian history of the afterlife and of hell, there are three views that have always been within the Christian tradition throughout all history. And the first being, of course, eternal damnation, which is the one people usually think of. Other one being universalism, which is all people are actually saved. And the other one being annihilationism, which says some people actually do get sent to damnation, but they are annihilated. They cease to exist. They're not tortured forever and ever. Also, there are several universalists that believe that there are a group of people that are damned, but they don't get tortured. They're just purified through fire in order to become a part of the larger group. Anyway, the reason 
there are these three major views throughout all of Christian history is because there's verses in the Bible to back all three of them up. Most definitely. They're all in there. You cannot deny that they're not in there. They are definitely in there. But what Christians do is they look at the list for each one, even if it's completely subconsciously, and they take that list of verses of that support that view and use it as a lens to look at the other verses so for example if you believe in the list of verses that support eternal damnations as the primary verses you use that as a lens to look at the ones that seem to support universalism and say it must not really mean all people when it talks about all people being saved and reconciled and renewed and restored maybe it just means all christians or if you take the universalism list of scriptures you use that as a lens and look at the eternal damnation scriptures and say uh, when it says eternal damnation, we should probably look at the context and look at the Greek and the original meaning of those words that we get eternal and damnation for in order to read it differently because how could these make sense with those other verses that say everyone is going to be saved? I think it would help us all out if all Christians just admitted that we pick and choose. But ultimately, I think the universalism scriptures make way more sense within the context of the entire narrative of the Bible, particularly because the Old Testament God seemed to punish his people strictly for the purpose of restoration, not just for damnation. And ultimately, though, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a universalist, though, because I don't know what happens after we die. How could I? It's all speculation. And ultimately, Jesus says he came to bring us life and life to the fullest. That means it's about right here and right now. And he defines eternal life as a type of life that's able to be lived right here and right now, not something that happens after we die. So through studying all these things out, like I said, I ended up in a place where I no longer fit within evangelicalism and I had to leave. But I very much still see myself as a Christian and I see myself as just simply being honest about all this stuff. And when I think back to how come there are so many ministers that I knew that I know saw the things I did and read the things I did and don't actually shift. I think it's because when you're studying these things out, you come upon a revelation and in that moment you have to choose. Do I choose honesty to the truth and search this thing out? Or do I just choose loyalty to my tribe and just ignore it and pretend I didn't see it? Or just read my people's uh, defense of the position that is against this so I don't have to think about it because it's too overwhelming and I've met plenty of Christians when talking about certain issues that say I just don't want to think about that that's, that's too much I'm not that type of person I want to chase after honesty so yeah that's where I am today and I encourage all of you out there keep chasing honesty even if that leads you outside of Christianity keep chasing honesty honesty to the truth, not loyalty to these tribes, because tribes come and go. And I think evangelicalism is one of the tribes that's just going to come and go, similar to how Puritanism, original Puritanism, just came and went. There was a time period where people would look around and say, what is Christianity? All these Puritans, like today, when you say, what is Christianity? You usually say all these evangelicals. It's going to come and go. We're going to move on. We always do. The church will change. So, Thank you for watching this video. I hope this was helpful. I hope this was informative. And most of all, I hope this is encouraging to people who are thinking of actually making some changes in their life, going through transitions, shifting. You have to keep growing. I know it's hard, but it's worth it. Thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.